does, does everybody know why we're here? Cyber something, I like that. Cyber, 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 yes. Um, so, <clears throat> this is my third talk today, so the talks are starting to blend together in my head. If I go off topic, let me know. Uh, <clears throat> the talk is called SCADA and ICS for Security Experts, uh, because most security experts are really, 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 really bad at talking about this stuff. Um, this is not a talk about SCADA. This is a talk about talking about SCADA, which turns out to be even more important. So, <clears throat> standard disclaimers. Uh, I last gave this talk at Black Hat Europe about um, a few days ago, I think, in Barcelona. I escaped volcanic ash, and I'm here. I've been doing InfoSec for a while. Um, important to note, I've, I've done the finance vertical, so I know about banks and accounting and debits and credits, and I've also done the utilities vertical, so I know about things that go bump in the plant and those big wire things that make the landscape look like crap. Uh, and I've done hacker stuff, and above all else, I am not an expert. And anybody who thinks they're an expert <laughs> isn't. So <clears throat> the InfoSec industry um, is all about the stupid at this point. I mean, like beyond reproach, all about the stupid, and we need to stop. About 2005, um, all of a sudden, everybody knew the word SCADA. I mean, it, it was as bad then as APT is now. APT reference number one. <clears throat> it was identified as a market. There was a vertical there. We could productize and do awesome stuff. Really? Um, follow the most likely situation. This is the dawn of compliance and regulatory requirements for security in public sector, utilities, and really, really, really big things like pipelines. So you're, we're talking about the original NERC 1200 emergency action standard, and we're talking about ISA 99. All of a sudden, the floodgates on the money came out. It was Y2K all over again, just in time. And um, <clears throat> a packet is a packet is a packet, right? I mean, a as far as I know. And so, hey, we got a million security experts. They're all now SCADA security experts, because it's just packets, right? No? Yes? In five slides, I will, I promise. Sometimes you have to wait for the story to unfold. And at this point, I'm a bit of a storyteller. I promise I won't go over, though, I swear. Um, <clears throat> there's a four-letter security religion that, that jumped all over this. I think you know who they are. Um, I was working in control system security, uh, electricity in particular. Um, and as much as I could, I spent a lot of time pointing out these flawed responses and stuff. And it actually led to the coining of a term, cyber douchery. I can't believe that I actually managed to coin a term in the English language because we have words for freaking everything. Um, they're flawed responses to a real problem. Uh, a lot of people who wear ties and blue jackets um, dudes and dudettes started showing up. And they were telling me about all the problems that I had, and they were telling me that they could solve them for me um, because they knew control system security. And they tied a little bow on the problem, and they said, it's something that we understand because we have all kinds of experience at this stuff. If you give us a big wad of cash, we'll give you some blinky lights and some shiny things, and it's going to be great. I'm still waiting for what it's worth. So I told you we were going to talk about SCADA systems. Um, the short form part of it is that language is really important. There's an element of specificity that engineers really enjoy. They have their lexicon 
and you need to use their lexicon um, or else, essentially. So <clears throat> they're kind of like car people. Does anybody know car people? If, if you go to a car person and you tell them that you're going to help them out with their transmission problems, you've got this great new product from Shimano that's going to make sure the chain moves easily from the fourth sprocket to the fifth sprocket with just one click. That's about where the InfoSec industry is right now in relation to real control systems. You couldn't be more freaking wrong. But it doesn't change the fact that they still all talk about it all the time. Not all SCADA is SCADA, okay? This is what the news uses. This is an actual term, an engineering term, and you commingle them at your peril. Highly distributed systems used to control geographically dispersed assets like water supply systems, oil and gas systems, electrical power grids, railways, those are SCADA systems. They're big, really big. Think thousands of kilometers from end to end. Um, that's hundreds of miles from end to end for this audience. Um, <clears throat> the rest of the world found metric. Get with the program. <clears throat> These are places where centralized data acquisition and control are critical because the system is too big for distributed control to work, okay? Big, big systems need central control because there are so many moving pieces that doing it in this weird little bits and pieces way just doesn't work out. The central systems are where all the smart stuff happens. So these will be systems where big math calculations have to be run. Like if you're gonna figure out all of the generation and all of the load for a state, Okay, that's, that's math. Like, big, honking, scary, giant math. Because the first thing they do is they figure out if the state was a copper plate and all other things were equal, here's what it would look like. And then, oh crap, the state's not a copper plate. We have yet to pave the world. We're gonna have to figure out where the wires are and figure out, okay, um, is it a summer day or a winter day? Because the conductivity of the cables changes depending on their temperature. That's physics, so now you got physics and math. It's starting to get really complicated, so you need racks and racks and racks of machines to handle this because you've got to run this calculation every five minutes. And sometimes it completes at 459,995. <laughs> so you're getting the answer just in time. That is supervisory control. So there is still an element of local control. It's supervisory control and data acquisition. The data acquisition part is much more related to metrics for system performance. And unlike the entire security industry, they actually do a good job of metrics and systems. It's pretty awesome. <clears throat> Control systems, on the other hand, are used for little things like power plants and giant chemical factories and <clears throat> that go, oh my God. Somebody playing IR games in here? Oh my God, the computer's broken. I'm serious, it's actually frozen up. Oh my God, my computer is frozen up. I, I, would, I would like to point out that <laughs> this is something like uh, two hours and 20 minutes that I've been talking without issue, and now it's going to screw up. Are you kidding me? Force quit is awesome. 
Oh, crap. No, it's actually quitting. That's what it's in the process of doing. I didn't ask it to, but that's what it's doing. Due to the fact that there was not a complete abject failure of my computer, uh, the audience was uh, pretty good about it. Huh? Nope. Absolutely not. Uh, mostly because in Europe I didn't use that word. Uh, <laughs> I, w I was told by the, um, the Black Hat speaker liaison that they were trying to figure out how you could have a computer-based shower. Um, so I'm going to keep talking because, believe it or not, I can talk without slides. The slides are just fancy. Uh, so control systems are little things like power plants and chemistry plants. And the, the work that they do is generally done by discrete elements called PLCs, programmable logic controllers, that can work just fine on their own. Okay? Uh, a manufacturing plant isn't comprised of one machine, with very few exceptions. It's comprised of a very large number of individual machines that all do their own thing. They do their own work. They know how to do what they do when they do. They're actually pretty smart about it. The problem is that um, the only way to actually, does anybody know my password? Uh, the only way to actually manage that and run that in a sane way um, is to run from machine to machine monitoring its state. And sometimes you have to carry state from one machine to another. And as it turns out, this is a really, really bad use of human's time. Um, and it's something that computers are fairly good at. So they started taking all the feeds from all of these PLCs and they brought them together into a place where you could sit in a nice comfy chair and look at blinky lights and shiny things and occasionally push buttons and where necessary state would be passed from system to system. Okay. Um, we're launching iTunes? Are you kidding me? <laughs> The last person to touch my computer was Jackie. In the bar. What, what? You did nothing? Okay. Nothing. Nothing. Um, at this juncture, I'm willing to say we're not far off. Um, this is not a con, right? Yeah, but Nauticon doesn't use that kind of numbers. Uh, it's Nauticon 7. Why is the Nauticon 7 folder empty? <laughs> <laughs> this is not funny anymore. I want to go home. <laughs> yeah, with my external hard drive, yeah. Um, so these control systems that come together, they, they are for controlling these discrete and separate elements in manufacturing plants, power plants, like there's the thing that runs the hopper that feeds the coal into the giant oven that burns the coal that dumps the Ohio coal dust all over Ontario. Um, <laughs> there's a whole system of, of, of capabilities and capacities. And so it's got a feed that says, this is how hard the oven is working, this is how much fuel we need, this is what our usual burn rate looks like. It feeds that information back up to the office so they can make budgetary decisions about how much money they've spent on coal and what their pricing model should be and your computer's firewall settings. <laughs> <clears throat> Loving this. Uh, <clears throat> oh my, the words that I'm coming up with right now that are not safe. I'm self-censoring. You're right. You're absolutely right. Yes, it does. Funny you should ask. This, I think, is the slide we were on. So really, really fast. It gives you a nice comfy place to sit down. There's lots of buttons. You find them all over the place. That's beverage processing. That's uh, making donuts. That's making the donuts sticky. Um, all of these capabilities are brought together to provide orchestration. Um, PLCs look like that. Use them to run conveyor belts and crazy stuff. Use them to run steel plants. 
industrial control systems or distributed control systems seems to be what that industry is calling their toys. Okay, and remember what we were talking about how it's important that we don't try to tell them how to use their own words. We use their words and we're very polite about using their words in their way. So these are generally process oriented. Um, you can walk from one side of the area controlled to the other side of the area controlled in something less than your lifetime. Okay, they're pretty discreet. Um, there are way more of these than there are SCADA systems. Like by a factor of 10,000 to one, there's a lot of them. Um, and more than anything, the InfoSec industry has failed to comprehend, like the question that I'm about to answer that was asked, um, the computers aren't the be all and end all. In, I don't even remember which talk, two talks ago I said um, that if you don't know what your company does, you're not doing a good job of InfoSec. If you walk into an IT department and they say, well, we run the computers, they don't know what they do either. Um, if you break the computer, do you actually break everything? Do you? Hands up. If you break the computer, everything breaks. Okay, so does, does the, all of the process controlled systems break if you break the computer? Uh, we're talking about ICS, DCS. We're not going to talk about SCADA for a while. N no, you don't. And no, you don't break everything. It is impossible to break a manufacturing plant by breaking its computer. It is absolutely impossible. Because what happens when the computer goes out of the loop is the same thing that happens when somebody falls into the system. Okay? If you're making a big batch of beer and Ed ends up in the wart, the system stops working. If the system thinks that Ed fell into the wart, the system stops working. And because the data is real easy to get along with, I mean, there you go, protocol data. Okay? Um, I know what this is, but you know, it, it could be anything from EIP, DH, Profibuzz, DCP1, DMP3, GDAC 720, ICCP, Landis and Gear 8979, OPC, Control Net, Modbus, TRW 9550, UCA. I mean, it could be almost anything. This is also data. And I mean, I, I, you can see it's E, M, right? So, I mean, you can take this apart, right? No problem. But the data doesn't include any information about this. None at all. So, if you know which PLC you're attached to, unlikely, and if you know where it is in the process, unlikely, and you can figure out what state you need to change in that PLC. So if you energize coil 13 in that PLC, what does it do to this process? It might break it. You might end up flipping the right bit that causes all of these bottles to fall off the conveyor. And so somebody hits an e-stop button or the computer decides it's time to e-stop because the conveyor is not carrying the correct weight capacity anymore. Because you don't know the process. You need to find or see the process map. That was sharp. Um, <clears throat> without the process map, the protocol data is useless. It's just a binary stream. You can talk about how it's formatted. Sure. You can, you can blow buffer sizes out because embedded systems aren't well tested and and you send it a really big ping packet and it falls over and goes boom. But you're stuck. Because I know I, you, you throw Wireshark on it and look at what the protocol is doing and what it's saying. But can you break the controls? Really? Can you break them in a way that does what you want them to do? And can you break all the additional controls? Because the computer is one. Just like in the finance industry, there are more than one controls. There are safety controls that make sure that zombies don't happen to you. There's QA testing, lots of it. Because if the toothpaste is the wrong color, they have a problem. Their marketing department will crap. So they pull stuff out and, and they do testing on it. They do a lot of testing actually um, in every manufacturing plant Nothing goes out without the QA test being passed. 
they will cheerfully pitch a batch if they even think there's a chance it's not clean. So you manage to make cookies of death, <laughs> cyber cookies of death, <laughs> because you learned the entire protocol space for the manufacturers that they use, not the standard, not the spec, but the protocol space as implemented by the manufacturers they use. And you have the process map that tells you, here's how you make a cookie. I mean, can anybody even recount how to make a cookie at home, let alone make a cookie on a manufacturing plant 1,000 a minute, 10,000 a minute? And then you figured out how to tweak the one part of the protocol that makes it so that instead of adding lovely chocolate chips, it adds number nine bolts. <laughs> or, you know, because every, every food manufacturing plant has the let's add cyanide to the mix <laughs> option. Um, it, it is actually, it's in the IP spec though. It's controlled by the evil bit setting. <laughs> so, at the end of the day, there's always, you're getting into what we refer to as um, tinfoil hat territory at that point. Well, you, I mean, you, your scenario already is an insider attack, right, where the entire process is understood. So I'm, I'm just saying. No, it isn't. I'm saying if you could find all of that out, if, then maybe you'd have a chance of having cookies that are bad rather than no cookies at all. Having cookies that are bad in a way that is specifically useful to you we're getting into the kinds of realms of probability where the numbers are so big, we can't use computers to compute them anymore. Okay, we're talking about stuff that is deeply unpossible. If it's a true insider attack, there are easier ways to screw the system up. Much easier. Contaminate source materials. Um, if it's a power plant, diesel fuel and fertilizer can do wonders at stopping power plants from operating if you blow up the uplink transformers. There's lots of bad things that you can do that are so much easier than the amount of time that it would take to reverse engineer an entire process control system from scratch. And at the end of the day, there's still people because we're not okay with having systems that don't have an operator or a controller or an organic mental core. Um, <clears throat> it's mostly because of liability issues, really. I mean, it, as soon as the human takes their hand off the switch, the insurance companies start to have a bit of a fit, right? Bags of mostly water are really much, much more suited to doing in situ problem solving than computers probably ever will be. I'll be quoted with my 640 kilobyte statement on that one, but our once and future masters may not get to that point. We don't know yet. So exactly to your point, you are a super hacker. You broke into the whole thing. Well, they plan for that because stuff breaks. Self-censored slide. Um, they plan for that to happen. They have systems that can handle multiple simultaneous failures um, without even skipping a beat, really, because failures happen all the time, right? I mean, it, it, stuff breaks. It's called entropy. You can choose to get used to it or not. Um, wires come down and they get rehung. I mean, I didn't include videos in this because I thought that would be the way to cause the system to fail, but it turns out it just breaks. Um, <laughs> they do high tension line repairs from helicopters on live lines. So 230 kilovolts of power hanging from a helicopter wearing a personal Faraday suit. They do that stuff all the time. And Fixes happen, you know, they, they weld pipelines that have oil in them. For the most part, 99 times out of 100, more like 99,999 times out of 100,000, you don't feel it at all. Nothing changes in your world. You've got a cozy little house, nobody's wandering the streets looking for flesh to feed on. You just don't notice. 
That's what we're accustomed to in North America. The, the, the abject catastrophic failure stuff could happen in North America. The blackout of 2003, fans of the blackout of 2003, it was awesome, wasn't it? Okay, fans of the blackout of 2011 in mid-January. How many, how many people popsicles would you have in Ohio and Ontario and New York and Pennsylvania and Manitoba and Quebec? Yeah, uh, I think it would be worse because those people are actually prepared. If the ice storm thing happened to Hamilton where I live or Cleveland where you guys live, um, <clears throat> Let's just say it would be a good idea to have Tom Eston on your side. <laughs> but wait. The Aurora Explosion demo video. 2007. Under very controlled circumstances with complete insider knowledge, it's possible to cause a generator to overspin. It's true. Um, you can cause a nuclear plant to overspin if you brush a tree against it. Ohio's good at that. <laughs> it's possible to make things go bang. It's possible to make individual components go bang. Suggesting that your average garden variety, not a con or DEF CON hacker, can do this, you know, today, not gonna happen. Unless you're a real insider. In which case, the guys with the blue suits already know where you live. Maybe. Um, so we're all perfectly smart, right? Because we're really good at focusing our attention. And I didn't even have to say it. You knew it. <clears throat> um, you've solved all of your organizational problems, right? I mean, you've got time. Your AV is working perfectly. Your firewall has both inbound and outbound rules. Your IPS is tuned. You get, you know maybe two or three alerts a day. You've read all of the log files that are available and checked them for badness. You've got plenty of time, right? <clears throat> the trouble is the organization's at war. Even in really well-behaved, really mature organizations, the business and the IT folks get, don't get along. The IT folks and the control systems folks don't get along. Everybody's got their little pile of stuff they need to hug. Silos are still there. If you can find an organization that has more than zero employees that doesn't have silos, that's heavenly. Um, I'm glad your fantasies are working for you because I've never, ever seen it. Um, but you're not the expert. It doesn't matter how much time you've put into this stuff. I, I've been touching control systems for 15 years. I'm not an expert. There is a crap ton of stuff that I don't know, and I won't ever know. Um, if you suck it up, maybe buy some people some coffee. Make friends. Have you heard of these things? They're called friends. I refer to them as work-related acquaintances, but uh, you need to do a bunch of learning. Okay? It takes a certain amount of humility to sit and look at the person who's going to teach you and think to yourself, oh, they're just some gas bag, they don't know what they're talking about. This one time at DEF CON, I saw somebody with a Modbus TCP fuzzer. It, you need to be the student first. Later on, you can be the teacher, but you need to be the student first. And that level of humility doesn't come easily to InfoSec people. Um, you have to show this willingness to be a friend, to be somebody who understands that Everyone is a unique, special person. And get to the point where stuff is making sense for a relationship. And once the relationship is there, you've got some foundation for let's work together. And once you can work together, you can move that forward to, hey, I know something that you don't know. And they can say, hey, I know something that you don't know. Because when you say, let's put cryptography on that link, and they say, actually, availability is more important to us than confidentiality, you dumbass. And you could say, okay, well, we're gonna put this bump in the wire in the way, and they say it's gonna add 50 milliseconds worth of potential lag to our connection on that particular system, and we're doing sub 25 millisecond response times, so that's gonna really break things badly. Um, we're not gonna get cyber cookies of death, we're just gonna get a plant that doesn't work, and well, it pisses people off a lot, actually. So here's some things that I learned as a control systems dude back before there was anybody to stand in front of me and tell me what I needed to learn. Um, <clears throat> unions. Pretty much anywhere where you've got control systems or SCADA, you've got unions. 
I was in a union as an information security professional. First day on that job, they took me down to the loading dock and they gave me a talk about how we had a good thing going. I wish I was joking. I'm looking at this guy who's telling me not to rock the boat, saying, I'm sorry, it's my job to rock, the that's what they hired me to do. And hey, we're an InfoSec, we're rock stars, baby. Right? No? Okay. The vast majority of the people who work in the control systems world are um, perfectly happy with good old 8-bit computers, S100 buses, fancy, and uh, those computers knew their place in this world, baby. That's the way that stuff's done. And uh, you are the age of their children. They can't take you seriously because whenever you look at one of your kids, you still see that kid when they were little. So in their mind, you are simultaneously 30-something and 10 or 5. What can this kid possibly know? So you have to do the unthinkable. Um, you have to understand the organization, all of the moving pieces. Hacking an organization is no different from hacking any other system. It's just a system. For the most part, hackers are system people. You look at systems of things and you figure out how that system works, what the interrelations are, what's important to other parts, what's predicate, what's subjugate. You know this stuff. You probably know it in such an intuitive way that you can't even describe how you know it. You just do. You pick something up and you look at it. Manuals are not for you. You need to do that to an organization. And all that requires is this little tiny, mind, little tiny flip in your head that says, oh, wow. This is just a bunch of moving pieces. There's some bags of mostly water involved, and it's all good. I, I know how to do this. Shadow a few of the workers. Figure out what it is that they do. Um, get all mitnicky. It's awesome. Um, <clears throat> because doors can open, and you can get things done. You can learn anything fast. I mean, yes, I just gave you crap for being a rock star, but you are a rock star. You're an infovore, man. If there is something that is documented, you will read that, you will comprehend it, you will know it. You know, the, the classic statement to a hacker is, hey, what do you know about XYZ? And they'll respond with SFA. Talk to me tomorrow. And by tomorrow, they've autodidactically become an expert in XYZ. That's what we do. So do it. Make them change after you understand how to change that system. If you can change a phone system or a computer system or any other hardware system, a lock, if you can change that, you can change an organization. So just for review, because this is important, um, in order to put new information into a brain, you need to pull old information out. And there's a lot of preconceptions that have been built up about how these computer things work. Um, Here's the thing, you're fixated on the protocol, abjectly fixated on the protocol, <laughs> and this fixation on the protocol, oh, you thought we had to get this stuff out of other people's heads? No, I gotta get this out of your heads, because you know what, Modbus, TCP, DNP3, whatever that thing is, you're looking in the wrong place for the problem. That's not where the problems are, you're doing it wrong. Wrong, 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 wrong. You're allowed to do this and that. But not on control systems because you'll break them. Because their IP stacks were implemented by people who don't understand what IP stands for. Um, <clears throat> Type cookie. Um, there are different kinds of user interfaces. Uh, this is the kind of user interface that, you know, you, you think about how you would create, you know, a virtual wall board or something. It, the problem is that you've got to get all of these 40-year-old guys who are also on chat roulette out of the way. Um, <clears throat> you've got nothing but time because those log files are done, right? You have them. You've checked everything, right? It's, you're covered. And you're doing the same old, same old. 
you're looking in the wrong place for the weirdness. The weirdness is not going to be in the protocol. The weirdness is going to show up in other places. It's going to show up in visualization. It's going to show up in crappy code that's running on the embedded systems. It's going to show up in lazy PLC implementers. It's going to show up in lazy, stupid manufacturing salespeople who sell you things like, you can get your human machine interface on your BlackBerry. And the code problem isn't going to be in Modbus TCP. It's going to be in the interface between the HMI on your BlackBerry and the HMI that's running on the Windows machine in the plant, and you're using VNC to connect between them. Right? These people are making decisions based on what? Wrong screen. No, not them, not them. Them. These people are making decisions based on what they see, and you can change what they see. If they think it's state A, and that's bad, so they flip it to state B, but really it was state B before, and you just made them flip it to state A, and you don't need to know anything about SCADA to do that. You just need to know how to hack GDI primitives in remote desktop, which, you know, remote desktop proxy that lets you change GDI primitives, that's hard. Really, really hard. Um, <clears throat> this is a bit of a special part of the presentation. It's almost guaranteed at this point not to work. I need everybody to take a deep breath, okay? Deep breath. And let's sing together. <laughs> Nobody's singing. There we go. <sighs> There's a hacker behind every bush. The media love these stories. There's a hacker that shops at Jinx because that's where you find all the best hackers. Um, the same stories keep getting recycled for our pleasure. I, how many times do you have to hear the same story over and over again before you're saying, well, didn't we hear about this 10 months ago? Um, it's ter you have to move because of hackers. It's, <sighs> it's starting to get to the point where all media is acting like local news stations. All right, I, I grew up in southwestern Ontario, so I watched a lot of WKBW news out of Buffalo. Did you know that every day most of Buffalo burns to the ground? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it's to the point where I, you can hear them in your head. Excess dihydrogen monoxide can kill you and it's everywhere. More news tonight at 11 on Action One News. And, okay. Nine liters of it, not healthy. <clears throat> Here's the thing. I vaguely remember being 14. Last thing I was interested in world, was world domination, because 14. <clears throat> At eight, it was world domination. At 14, it was girls. Um, <clears throat> The uh, neocon movement, of course, wants you to think that it's brown people. Um, <laughs> really, it's, um, well, hacker. So easy a white guy can do it. There's a story in the news um, last Wednesday. Booz Allen Hamilton uh, is being paid to build the Air Force Cyber War Control Center, which <clears throat> includes a cyber war bunker at the U.S. Cyber Command, a wing of the Air Force. Um, they've also won another contract for $20 million to, and I quote, foster collaboration amongst telecommunications researchers, University of Maryland faculty members, and other academic institutions to improve secure networking and telecommunications and boost information assurance. So $20 million is what it costs all you American taxpayers, to have Booz Allen Hamilton install a mailing list and a wiki. <laughs> With around the clock guards and bulletproof stuff. Um, we're all very afraid of this one, aren't we? Say afraid really fast a few times. Um, that's about as likely. <laughs> and 
don't even get me started on that internet thing. So, stuff that I've actually seen, documented, with my own two blue eyes that I cannot believe. This is the scope and scale of the problem that we're talking about. The way that you keep your SCADA networks and control systems networks separated from business networks and the internet is through the use of VLANs. <clears throat> um, the vendor default access, account name and password, that's the only one you need. Everybody should have a guest account with no password. <clears throat> um, if it's actually the primary human machine interface, so th like the seat, you know, like, like your Captain Kirk, um, that one is so critical to the organization that you can't put a username and password on it. Um, yeah, see, <clears throat> um, the real problem is that not only are they not testing the core OS, um, they're not removing applications that are unnecessary, so um, on those Windows HMI stations, it's been every single time that um, sol.exe has been executed lately. Um, and most HMIs do have full access to the internet, and histories include, well, porn and MySpace and stuff. Hmm? Yeah, that's great. Well done. Um, vendors should always have direct VPNs into the core of your production network so they can support you. Um, <clears throat> Did you know that Telnet is the best way to uh, log into systems? Um, yeah. uh, firewalls have really awesome rules in them. Uh, you know, FW add rule, allow TCP from any to any 0, 0655535. Everything works perfectly. Um, vendors love this idea almost especially in control systems of the turnkey solution. So if you need a palletizing system, so something that takes pallets and, and wraps the wrappy stuff around them and shuttles the pallets around, everybody just gets the same one with the same IP addressing scheme, usernames, passwords, remote access mechanisms, and vulnerabilities. Um, do you know what's really awesome about PLCs and, and the way that they communicate their information back to this central control station the most awesome part is that if you need to work on an individual PLC, you just log into the embedded web server on it and make the changes there. Um, <clears throat> so that least privilege thing, they don't do that. Uh, race conditions, yeah, they, they, they do lots of those. Um, what's really cool though is when they have proprietary encryption technology Double rot 13. <laughs> um, RSH, RCP, way better than those S services. Those are just crap. Um, except all multicast. Really. So that stuff's all real. I've seen all of it. There's other stuff that I had in that slide I decided not to tell you. Um, you can save it if you really, I mean, if you've got the right people, like lateral thinkers, you'll, you'll probably manage to save it. Um, they could have done some other things, though, because these people are hard to employ. Um, they tend to stand in, in solid positions for long periods of time. Um, there's a lot of uh, encouragement required to get them to move from one side of the green square to the other side of the green square. If they'd done the rocket science of following the damn instructions, because the systems have gotten even to the point now where they're saying, you should contemplate changing the passwords. So, I mean, they're not great yet, but they're getting there. So following the instructions would have been good, a good start. Um, you could just not suck. Because, you know, it, it's easier 
to do something that's, you know, like when you're building a house, it's way better to do minimum code standard than to build a house that'll actually stand up for more than seven or eight years, right? Because, I mean, that's all you have to do. So, I mean, if you just, just, just get that thing in, just install it and, and, and it'll be fine, we'll get back to it. Yeah. The machines only do as well as their masters. So, if you tell it to do stupid things or you treat it with indifference, it's, well, you can't anthropomize com computers because they hate that, so you have to be very careful about doing the right thing. Um, the industry is trying really, really hard to keep up. And InfoSec are kind of like a bunch of rabbits, and it's entirely possible that they will catch up with their own awesome. Um, but as long as you're operating the HMI from your BlackBerry, I'm thinking that this is ultimately doomed to failure because <coughs> they've fallen down the features are better than functionality path. Um, if they don't have 85 bullet points on that marketing slick, then they're not doing it right. And it's very hard to include the idea of not just doing the job, but doing the job well on a marketing slick. That doesn't work out. So I'm gonna ask you to do some things. Is everybody ready to do some things? I mean, you sucked at the, at the singing part, so. I, I need you to consume knowledge. Read everything that you can. Don't talk yet, just read, learn. There's a lot of information out there, um, mostly because the companies tend to put all of their code and updates on their FTP servers, which you can access using username anonymous. If you find somebody who claims to be an expert, they're not. And if anybody around here has referred to themselves recently as an expert, spank yourself or have somebody else take care of that for you. <laughs> Project timelines and budgetary timelines are really long. If an organization is planning a control systems upgrade or a SCADA systems upgrade, it will take two years to get through the budgetary and procurement processes. That's two years for you to make a bunch of very tiny changes. That's two years for you to make friends with the procurement department. So you can get things included in the RFPs that say things like must be IPv6 capable because there's a chance in hell that they're gonna use somebody else's IP stack rather than their own. The BSD IP stack is better than the one that Bob, you know, down in product engineering implemented, right? So you can start putting these little things in because you're making friends and the friends are saying, well, yeah, I'll help you out with that instead of, you know, the bullshit emails with 10 CCs on them. Um, <clears throat> in terms of what we can do for our own industry, we need to start taking care of ourselves because we are looking bad. The people that are putting themselves out there as mouthpieces, there's a bun bunch of them that are, well, I mean, they have cred. It, it's old cred, but they have cred. If your bullshit meter's going off, maybe we should work together as a community to make those people stop talking. There are a few in particular that I am not going to name, but you know who they are. Call the charlatans out. Call a cyber douche when you see a cyber douche, okay? That's important for us because they're making us look bad and that's not okay. You're not zero cool. You're not Neo, you're not the plague, you're not John Travolta. <laughs> you're not any other uber leet dude or dudette. If you impress people with persuasion and humility rather than bravado, they'll listen to you because they're human and you can be too. It's all water drops, right? I mean, you can erode a mountain with a series of water drops. So when somebody says, we're gonna buy product XYZ, you can say, hey, can we buy product XYZ Mark II? And because you made friends, they'll say, oh, I didn't even know about that one. Hey, are you keeping up with my crap? Wow, you're cool. Make friends everywhere. Um, <clears throat> there's an unbelievably vast, dense history in our community and in our industry, we are not tapping it with any regularity. There's a lot of it out there. There are people who are historians of our community. He's here. Tap the history because the lessons in there are rich. There are lots of comparable situations. These problems have been found before and they have been solved. Learn from them. Once upon a time, computers did what they were supposed to do. 
computers were machines that were predictable. They had a finite result if you gave them a finite input. I would argue today that computers are not like that. They do things that are unpredictable. There is an element of chaos in there because nobody has the gestalt of the whole system. That's gone. Those times, unfortunately, have passed, but I had to use the power button because I can't take the battery out of this thing. <laughs> Let's get computers to do what they're supposed to do. Let's get back to a point where we can count on our systems to be systems. Please, thank you. If you have any questions, I've run out of time due to what we'll call a computer failure. Um, I've got time for like one that I'll take and then I'll be out in the hall and I'll talk for as long as you want me to talk. You talked to me the whole thing. That guy back there didn't. You had your hand up, I saw it. You're saying that these really large systems are supposed to be uncontrollable by, distri by distributed systems. The, the SCADA is, yep. I'm sorry, I am a complete noob in this room. That's all right. I apologize for You're my allowed noobness. to be. You know what? You just did the best thing ever because you said, hey, I don't know. Um, but yet the computers are supposed to become, or the, the programs running these are supposed to become simpler and, and more predictable. Yes. Isn't that a perfect application for distributed systems that are simple and componentized? No. I did a bad job of explaining something, so I will very briefly answer your question. Uh, the shortest version of it is, there's still lots of distributed control stuff. Those safety systems I was talking about, there, there are other things that are happening in the, dis in, the, in the dispersed systems that are okay. The information is coming back to core systems that are unnecessarily complex. This stuff used to run on minis and mains, most of it runs now on what you would think of as aged systems like uh, True64 and AIX. They're transmitting all of that stuff forward now to run on um, NT4 and Windows 2000, which I would argue are intensely complex systems relative to their immediate forebearers. Um, NT4 and NT2000 are less well understood than Unix is. Um, so let's extract a bunch of that. Comp yeah, you notice that I said they're moving forward towards NT4. I'm not kidding. Um, even Windows 2008 is an intensely complex system for what doesn't need to be there. So they're using common off-the-shelf stuff because they can, but you know, even if you run the stripped down you know, command line only Windows 2008, it's still got a lot of intrinsic complexity that's not necessary to do the thing that you want to do. Um, th that computer is no longer 100% predictable, right? Um, not in a way that a system that is well understood where I, there's probably still one or two people on this planet that understand how Unix works. We know there's no one that understands Windows, right? So we can just push forward to take the complexity out of the unnecessary places. Having a, a complex operating system is not necessary because you're not trying to do that kind of stuff. It, it's like having an Oracle database. You don't put a big crazy complex operating system underneath an Oracle database because you don't need it. You put exactly what you need and only what you need. Uh, that makes Larry really happy. Um, you have to figure out where you want the complexity to happen. And the reason why I'm saying simplify where you can and where you have to and leave the complex there is because that complexity um, probably took 30 years to build. Like in the case of a power grid, um, that network map thing that I was talking about, that where you have to understand how all those moving pieces are, just making that function takes about 30 years. Um, so it's not the kind of thing that you can change out real easily. That part's supposed to be complex. It's the everything else, right? It's, it's, the, it's the using Windows as your HMI. Um, X Windows would work fine. X Windows on a Wise terminal would be a whole lot better, safer, and more awesome than Windows, you know, Vista with an open window. So, you know, cut it down to what it needs to be rather than what you've got. Does that make sense? You're still looking at me like kind of vaguely, like, or is it just that you're blurry? Okay. Smile. It's all good. Huh? It's all good? Yes. Okay. I don't have time for any more questions, so I'll talk to you outside. Thank you.